Uh, what you're seeing before you is a sharecropper's contract. Uh, and what you probably don't notice is that uh, this thing doesn't seem to work. Uh, over here, you have the guy signing with an X. It's a former slave. Uh, it's a very interesting document. And that's the kind of thing you find yourself studying when you're uh, uh, doing the study of institutions. Why was this sharecropping contract for one half of the crop identical to what would have been the contract to a, uh, uh, a freeborn person in the state of North Carolina? Uh, the, um, uh, what I find striking is that in the standard paradigm, in the standard course, institutions hardly appear at all. Uh, basically, institutions appear here. The red line is basically, it says that you, in order to get something, you have to purchase it with the wealth that you have, uh, and you can't steal it, and it won't be given to you. Uh, so we, we have a, there, are, there is a sense of property rights. There are markets in which the law of the single price uh, works because they're competitive. Uh, there are some preferences, but they're just there. Uh, and the results, as it says here, are optimal. Doesn't even bother to say simply efficient, but they're optimal. Uh, and um, of course, this is, uh, this is a rather restricted domain in which institutions have uh, to, to function. Um, uh, institutions look a little different if the problem you're studying is, uh, uh, is fundamentally different to start with. Um, this, uh, as you probably now know, is the first unit of the, uh, of the core curriculum. Uh, we're talking, obviously, about an institutional revolution. That's the very beginning. Uh, and notice here the capstones, uh, if, you can, if, you, if their print isn't too small, you can see that they also evoke uh, problems of policy and uh, institutions. Um, I want to begin with a run through the curriculum, that is how, how we get from the beginning to the end. It'll obviously be very brief and simply I'll signal some of the things that we do. We start with the hockey stick of history. I'm sure you all know what it is, but I'll show you a picture anyway. Uh, we contrast global affluence and poverty and uh, uh, then that which we do in Unit 1 motivates um, a, uh, uh, the discussion of capitalism as a set of institutions. We define it as, uh, as such. And then we use that definition of this uh, set of institutions called capitalism. We deploy that to understand a Schumpeterian growth uh, and innovation process in Unit 2. This then motivates an introduction to uh, a general statement about what are institutions, and they are the rules of the game. Uh, we use uh, basics of game theory in uh, chapters uh, in units four and five uh, with the institutions described as the um, rules of the game. Um, the, uh, uh, we also then sh uh, show, and this is a major point, one of the more sophisticated ones that students ought to get, uh, that differences among institutions are characterized in part by differences among the Nash equilibria which they support. We teach students to think about that. Uh, Obviously, that has big ramifications for public policy. If you want to change an outcome, you have to change uh, institutions so that you get uh, a new Nash equilibrium. I outline this passage in red because if I were going to say one thing that really st we really want students to get is that if an exchange is voluntary, there must be the potential for mutual gains. That's what's in the conventional textbook, and that's right, that's gains from trade. But that very fact also means that there will be conflicts over how those mutual gains will be determined. Uh, and you might think, well, is that always the case? It is, yes, it is always the case, because uh, as we'll see later on, endowments uh, plus markets don't determine distribution of the mutual gains in, in all interesting cases. Uh, so uh, we, their institutions will, um, I say, hence the importance of institutions, they determine whether or not all the mutual gains uh, will be actually exploited, that is, whether we'll have an efficient outcome, and, what, and also how those gains will be distributed. We, that's introduced in Unit 5, um, and then that's then illustrated by the other kinds of institutions which we introduce later in the, uh, in the course, the firm and credit markets and uh, other, uh, other chapters. Uh, and these are illustrations of cases in which people come together because of the mutual gains, but they then have to work out how they're going to share those gains and how that is uh, influenced by the institutions under which they're, um, they're interacting. So let me know, I'll now go back over this with some highlights to illustrate what we try to do before uh, turning it over to Stephen. Uh, this is, of course, the, uh, the, this is where we start, uh, a very long-term per capita uh, income of the world, a thousand years. Uh, 
This is where the hockey stick comes in. Uh, you see immediately that something big happened here, and at least in the UK. Uh, students are very curious about that. Uh, you see that there's actually a series of hockey sticks, and students uh, will be very quick to say, well, what's going on here? And then part of, part of the answer, not all of it, is that there was changes in institutions or economic policies that were, which were intimately associated with the upturn in the hockey stick. Um, and uh, they pretty quickly can see that institutions matter for something as big as how a flat curve turns into one which appears to be vertical. We immediately then asked them, well, is, how could we actually determine whether institutions matter? And so we introduce a natural experiment comparing East and West Germany uh, and work them through a process by which a question as difficult as do institutions really matter can be answered using actual uh, data. Uh, and again, they get the point, but now they're getting an extra point, which is sometimes we can actually nail it down, uh, how, how much it mattered. Uh, uh, we also, still in Unit 1, turn to the question about uh, the, the countries that got capitalism, but they didn't get the revolution. Uh, we're thinking of places like you know, the Philippines, Nigeria, et cetera. Uh, and this is, of course, a dramatic picture of uneven development in the world, which is, again, determined in part by the kinds of institu institutions which were introduced in some countries, like Korea, Botswana, and so on, but not other places which, in which the curves look relatively uh, flat. Uh, and then we try to provide an explanation for the successful capitalist revolution countries and the ones that essentially converted to a system which is capitalist by our standard definition, but was not dynamic in this sense that, for example, England was in the 18th century uh, and, uh, and Korea has been in the 20th, in the 20th century. Um, we then turn to, uh, uh, a, this is the income distribution of the world. I know many of you have seen this figure before. I think it's my favorite in the entire, uh, in the entire unit. We have here uh, countries are arrayed from the poorest uh, to the richest here across the front, and from front to back, the poorest decile and the richest decile. And because some of you haven't done this, I just, I'll take just a minute to, uh, I won't take a minute for some reason. No, I can't, I can't open it. But in any case, what, what you'll find if you actually go online and get this, if you hover over any, the top of any bar, it'll say, for example, Botswana top decile uh, and the date and the number of amount of income. Now, what this does, if you let students mine this, they're going to come up with a whole lot of questions, like what, why, why are the rich in Botswana so rich compared to everybody else in Botswana, compared to other, other countries, and so on and so on. You can set a whole bunch of exercises on this. You may think this has to be wrong because China's down here, but that's 1980. We have, this, uh, we have a whole series. You can run it more or less as a film, uh, because we have 1980 to 2000. 14, I think, is the most recent one. It's, it's really fun to run it because you see China. China ends up over here, by the way, uh, and it keeps jumping over these countries. Uh, and then what's that about? Um, so, the, uh, 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 so students then come away from this with a set of questions, which is global wealth and affluence and poverty, on the other hand, and uh, these sharp changes, apparently changes in uh, dynamic process, uh, we would call a phase transition in math uh, or physics, that these things change, well, what accounts for them and how can we formalize them? Well, if we start off with a set of questions uh, which are different, uh, we're going to find that we have to go beyond just saying institutions matter. I mean, if I, if, if I had a, a, a pound or a euro for every time I've heard that institutions matter, I'd be a millionaire. Uh, I'd like to know how they matter, and I'd like to get some tools, some real analytical tools that'll help us work with what evidence we can have about institutions to see how they matter. Well, as I said before, if these are the problems, we're going to have to have some new concepts. And look how many of them have to do with institutions. Uh, again, the list is somewhat arbitrary, but uh, these questions here are not going to be answered with a thin view of institutions. Rather, they require something a little more elaborated. Uh, and to do that, uh, we in Unit 4 um, bring in, we study, it's called social interactions. It's about game theory and illustrated by experiments and behavioral economics. 
where we teach that institutions are the rules of the game. Um, and we also give them a nice experiment, which is the ultimatum game, which you all know about, in which um, the, uh, uh, here we have the fraction of the pi offered by the proposer to the responder. Just, I'm sure you remember the game, you just heard about it. The responder can offer any amount of the pi. The hitch is that the, re that the uh, um, sorry, the proposer can offer any amount. Uh, the responder can either agree or disagree. If the responder disagrees, the proposer gets nothing. Uh, well, um, the, um, uh, the fraction of the offers that are rejected uh, is extraordinarily high, 100%, that's the red bars, if you have one person who is the responder. Uh, but notice the blue bars is what happens if you have two responders. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is in one case you have no competition. That is, the responder can dictate the outcome of the game just by, by saying no. Even just adding one additional person, uh, a, comp a very small amount of competition indeed, quite radically changes the offers that would be rejected. So you find out even very low offers are quite often accepted because I know that if I, uh, you know, Suppose I reject the offer. Well, the other guy's probably selfish, and he'll accept the offer, and therefore the guy who offered this unfair offer is not going to get punished. So uh, this is a way of using, even as, as we can see, in a small experiment to say that institutions matter. Uh, as, for example, you'll see in the public goods game, where a rather small change, which is allowing people to observe and then uh, punish the people who, committed, uh, who offered low in the public goods game, um, that radically alters how that game is played. The, um, uh, before we get to the study of markets, we're studying the exercise of power and property rights, illustrated, as you probably know, by the uh, uh, institutions of a pirate ship. And there it is. That's, this says who gets what on the pirate ship. It's a fantastic uh, set of documents. Um, and we link this very closely to who gets what. So the theme of inequality is, 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 persists throughout this. Uh, and we use this in many places to describe, uh, this is our very simplest interpretation of uh, economic inequality arising from differences in endowments, institutions and policies and technology. This is, of course, made dynamic. You want to have arrows going to the next period and so on. But that's the basic idea. Uh, and we think, that is, uh, that is why activities like this, collective action, the uh, use of coercion and so on, this is a demonstration in El Salvador during the um, Civil War there, um, are important parts of how the income distribution is, is determined. Um, the, um, uh, uh, basically, the first real problem the students study about uh, looking at inequality, which Stephen is going to explain, is uh, the fable of Angela and Bruno, which is famous around the world now, and uh, Stephen will explain why it is. Uh, it's a bargaining problem. Um, but it, it, it's based on a very simple idea. People occupy different positions given economic institutions, owners, non-owners, and so on, voting rights or not. Um, the, the interactions in which they engage may be voluntary or coerced. Um, if they're voluntary, mutual gains are, are possible. They, otherwise, they wouldn't be engaged in them. And if they are uh, possible, then there's some battle over how they're going to be worked out. And that's what the model is designed to show, introducing a very simple bar bargaining framework. And then we illustrate this uh, by saying, well, how does that actually work out in the world? Uh, and we go to West Bengal, India, to study uh, here a policy to redistribute the surplus and to raise efficiency, which was a land tenure reform in the state of West Bengal called Operation Barga that lowered the landlord share uh, from a historically uh, given one half, uh, which had been in existence for five centuries, that is the landlord got half the crop, to the landlord would now get uh, a quarter. Uh, and uh, so we, th we then show them how to measure this on a Lorenz curve. These are the farmers up to there. The rest are the owners. This is the initial uh, uh, Lorenz curve. And the one closer to the equality line is the one which would re result after the change in the rental share. So that's, our, that's their first manipulation of a obviously very simple Lorenz curve. Um, now, uh, we then move on to a to more 
uh, applied to a modern capitalist economy kinds of problems. Uh, and uh, as Wendy said many times in her talks, uh, we focus on actors and what they do. We use principal agent um, uh, models to explain uh, how, how they work. Um, and um, the, uh, these are some of the important reasons why institutions occupy such an important part of our story. Because we have incomplete contracts, which means something else other than the enforcement of a contract has to be part of the exchange. Uh, whatever that is, it's going to be affected by institutions, bargaining power, social norms, and so on. Therefore, market failures are ubiquitous. Therefore, once again, institutions of some kind are going to be involved in trying to address the consequences of that. Um, and so uh, uh, we have this um, representation of the, uh, of the, uh, the firm and the labor market. Um, but then we immediately turn to the question of, because, because we have this kind of relationship, we have a new dimension of the labor market, which is a vertical dimension having to do with the exercise of power. Uh, throughout the curriculum, we have a thing called when economists uh, uh, disagree. And we have debates on unsolved or unsettled questions. But we thought it would be fun to hear put in when economists agree. Uh, and therefore, we have Ronald Coase and uh, Karl Marx on the firm with rather uh, a similar views of the power structure of the firm and why it is that firms are different from markets. Um, the, um, we have, of course, a series of these principal agent problems, each governed by slightly different uh, institutions, but embodying the same fundamental uh, uh, underlying problem. Uh, and we, of course, turn, as we, as we did yesterday, to the, the state, the government, uh, uh, with this model, uh, which uh, we discussed yesterday, of the, of the rent-seeking uh, dictator as a monopolist. Um, finally, and the, um, the, uh, we, we spend a lot of time doing public policy. And we have a kind of, I think, foundational theory of public policy, which is summarized by these two points. Um, uh, if you have a government policy, how people respond to a change in, say, taxes or subsidies or so on uh, is, gonna, is gonna be important in determining the effect of that, and that can be described by a shift in, in a Nash equilibrium. And therefore, policies will not work unless the intended outcome is a Nash equilibrium. Now, I mean, that's not, actually, it's very easy to see how forgetting that point can lead you to mistakes. When you, you think you can implement a policy as if a government can actually dictate an outcome, when, of course, the government is simply altering the conditions under which people make uh, their, um, uh, their decisions. Uh, I showed you this list yesterday of the Samuelsonian paradigm here on the left and the core paradigm on the right. Uh, virtually all the things on the right have something to do with institutions. I've highlighted them in red. Uh, so, there's something going on about institutions in all of those cases and probably in the others as well. Uh, in, order, uh, in closing, let me say what I think the big differences are between core and the other um, uh, uh, texts. Um, the idea of, of institutions as rules of the game, uh, that's new. Most, most texts don't teach game theory, so they can't have that view. And moreover, most people think of institutions as being like a central bank or something like that. It's actually an organization, some named body. Uh, the idea that the Nash equilibrium is a key notion taught early in the course and it's applied again and again to problems of implementation is important. Um, we have active, active actors, uh, price setters and so on. Um, the, um, a key point, endowments, technology and preferences are thought to determine outcomes in the standard paradigm along with say competitive markets. That typically is not the case. They don't determine outcomes at all because there usually is some bargaining over a surplus that's left that isn't determined by the fallback positions of the actors. The reason why that is so is because we have price setters who don't set prices so that people get their fallback option. They get better than their fallback option as we've seen, for example, in, in the employees getting rents in the, um, in the labor market. Uh, as a result of the fact that markets, per se, don't solve the distribution problem, then other institutions become much more important, how firms are organized, states, uh, trade unions, intellectual property, and so on. Uh, the key assumptions that differentiate us is the importance that we give to incomplete contracts, limits to competition. 
I think we also have a rather more balanced view of governments seen as, yes, possibly a, a solution, but also a problem. Uh, and you know, students learn what, what they may be examined on. And because we have a model of the, of the, a mono, the government as monopolist extracting rents, we know they're going to learn that. And they're going to really study why that, that, why that might be the case. We use history and cross-national comparisons much more to inform our institutional discussions. Um, institutions play a role in, an important role in equilibrium selection. Uh, that, that was a topic which was mentioned quite a few times in the very last uh, um, series, uh, series of talks. And there's an integral link with inequality and fairness as well as efficiency in evaluating normatively whether we, we think an institution is uh, functioning well. Uh, thank you very much. I turn it over to Stephen now to tell you the story of Bruno and Angela. Remember where you heard it first. It's very condensed. <laughs> uh, the word Bruno is now an epithet. Like people say that this guy's just a Bruno. So that's, that's why Stephen feels that he has to actually do this rehabilitation of Bruno. But, but for those of you who don't know who Bruno is, that, that, that this may be a bit mysterious. But I, 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 I think, I, I, so there's an element of trying to describe how I teach it, but there's also an element of of, of my mis some of my misgivings about about the way about the way this this, this unit is constructed. Um, so, the way I introduce Bruno, evidently, it's the same way it's introduced um, in in, uh, in 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 many other contexts. I mean, explicitly. As I say, I didn't I haven't actually taught this for two years. Uh, it was, I didn't teach it this year. But he, he, Bruno the bad, basically. Let's make you B for bad. Uh, it's clear cut. So basically, you know, going the various stages. The first stage. I make completely explicit. Um, it's sort of, core sort of doesn't quite make it quite so explicit. To me, it's as explicit. Angela is Bruno's slave. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there's some backstory, which is Angela was once a sort of subsistence farmer, leading her own happy life and op optimizing her utility. That was in Unit 3, I think. Uh, although she doesn't have a name in Unit 3. I think possibly she should have a name in Unit 3. And then along comes Bruno and steals it, and, and steals her. Okay, so that, so we're, we're talking about a very very stark situation, and and you know and and here like you know the, the institutions do indeed matter because ownership of a person was was once one of the institutions of life, um, and the thing you know and and the, the the model that comes in then is is a production function because the standard feasible frontier. So this is the production function flipped round uh, for Angela. The more she works, the more grain she produces. And then there's this, this um, point introduced is, you know, what are the feasible points? Well, you can draw the, you, the, you draw the usual feasible points in the frontier, and you think, well, any of those points are feasible in principle. But in fact, of course, um, and it, again, it's pretty brutal, uh, they're not all feasible because Angela has to live. And Bruno, as a slave owner, actually doesn't care about Angela. Has, I mean, one of the interesting things about this as well is Unit 4 with all the possible altruism and interaction, forget it. <laughs> okay, you've done that in Unit 4. It's, that's been switched off. I think, in a way, I think CORE should have a set of buttons which says, what are we switching on and what are we switching off? Altruism is switched off. Strategic interactions are switched off in this, in this, in this, in this context. Um, so so uh, Bruno doesn't care about Angela except to the extent that she produces food for Bruno. Um, and as such, you know, there is the, the, there's the biological survival constraint that, that Angela will die and therefore be no use. And, and you know, I, 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 Birkbeck, we have a lot of black students. And a lot of them, you know, they, uh, they have a back history where their, their uh, ancestors may well have been slaves. And so they're, they're, they're interested in this. And so, you know, I wish I could say a bit more about, about, about the, the, the master-slave relationship. But the point is, slaves have pecuniary value. And, and, and uh, maintaining the capital, which was the slave, was, was something that the masters actually did want to do. Um, but, of course, it, it was only in terms of thinking of them as, as productive capital. Um, and then, uh, so, so then, you know, uh, we, we then have Bruno's optimization, uh, 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 trying to maximise the gap between these two, and, 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 you, and, and you build up the optimization problem, and you get this first result, the standard result, that M, marginal rate of transformation is equal to marginal rate of substitution. I, he's, the, the term marginal rate of substitution has been hijacked here to mean marginal rate of survival substitution. Uh, 
Uh, uh, so it's not quite the dictionary definition. So MRSS might, might be better than MRS at this point. Um, and, and, and so you get this notion of, you know, the, the, uh, because it's, it's a piece of capital for Angela is capital to Bruno, so Bruno doesn't overutilize because it's inefficient. Um, and, then, and then you introduce, the, uh, you, you know, how, how do economists think about this? So we, you introduce uh, Pareto, uh, but you also introduce the concept of fairness. Um, and I think that's, uh, and the word, I, th I think the word Pareto optimal may have been in some of the early drafts, but, I, I, but the word Pareto efficient has is now replaced the word optimal everywhere because the word optimal is definitely wrong. It's about efficiency. Um, uh, and, and so, so we, we introduced the concept of Pareto efficiency. I don't know about your students. My students find it really hard. <laughs> that's why it takes two weeks to teach. Um, uh, but 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 I I, per, I persevere with this because and, and, and I think the, the the thing that they seem to get is the is the is the notion of Pareto inefficiency, the the, the mantra that it, that implies money is left on the table. They, they 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 seem to get that, and that therefore if you're in an inefficient place, you, you can you can you you can joint, jointly do better. So um, then then and this is a very stark point um, is. Slavery Pareto efficient? The answer is yes, slavery is Pareto efficient. Um, uh, you can only make Angela better off by, by making Bruno worse off. Um, so the first point at which, slave, at, at which Pareto efficiency is introduced, instead of in, in variance framework where it, you know, it's Pareto optimal, Pareto efficiency is slavery as, as an introductory. Whether that's too stark or not, I don't know. It's a, it's a nice change for, from other textbooks. Um, and then, you know, uh, well, I, I won't go through this, but I mean, you know, you have to spend quite a lot of time on this because uh, 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 the non-uniqueness of Pareto efficiency uh, and the, the, the key point that if you move between Pareto efficient points, that cannot be a Pareto improvement uh, is something that students really, really struggle with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of step back and just think about the, hundred, share, the hundred, sharing £100 problem at this stage. Uh, because it's, you, you can, it, it simplifies the problem down. So it's stepping away from, from, from Andrew and Bruno. But then you go back uh, to, to uh, uh, so slavery is pareto efficient, and then we have an institutional change. Slavery is abolished. Um, and I, 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 again, I, if I had time, I would find the reference for this, but the, I, the, 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 value, the, the, expro the property expropriation that slavery, the abolition of slavery was was, I think, the large, as a percentage of GDP, was the largest ever expropriation of property ever carried out. Um, and key point, that's not a Pareto improvement. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's, a, uh, a, a, it's a worsening Bruno to make Angela better off. And then, so the diagram now changes. So, so here's the biological survival constraint, um, and then here's Angela's reservation and difference curve. And here, one thing I would feed back into this is, so rather strikingly, Angela's not much better off. <laughs> We've had the biggest redistribution of property in history, and she's not much better off. Now, one, you know, if you could relate that forward, you could say, well, OK, so just because she owns herself now, she can't use that as collateral to borrow, so it may, maybe that's why she's not much better off. But I think possibly... Um, you know, I want one way to think about this, I, th I think you probably could draw the reservation and difference curve. Or you, I mean, I think the biological survival constraint, uh, constraint probably slopes up too, too much. I think there should be a bigger gap. Because remember that, that the slave owner works st slaves till they die. Uh, and and so, so values doesn't value their retirement. So you know, if you think about the, 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 the leisure aspect, it's lifetime leisure. So Angela would like to live a, an, an old life, a, a life in, into old age. So I think, in a way, it's... I mean, I, I, I think the data suggests that maybe the, the, the slaves weren't very much better off. But I, I, I'd like to know whether that, that relates... how well that relates to the data. Um, so then, then you, you now have an economically feasible set, which is, which is a smaller set, and then you have, and you have the same kind of optimization point. Uh, this diagram was cut and pasted from the latest website version, and I think I have pointed this out before, it's not quite correctly drawn, uh, but I've pointed that out, uh, I, I've let this know, I, I, Eileen know this, but basically you know, you, you, this diagram doesn't correspond to that diagram properly. Um, but 
key point, as ever, you, you know, you, what you end up with is uh, by a nice, I think, a nice doctoring of the model. We have quasi-linear preferences. So uh, all the indifference curve, Angela's indifference curves have the same slope on, on the vertical line, um, uh, which is <coughs> only, it like, worries me slightly because, because people will, students may end up thinking this is a quasi-linear preferences or a feature of life. Um, but all the same, it's it, it sort of, uh, you know, I, I, think it, I think it was a worthwhile simplification in the model. Um, uh, so, so then we have the point that anywhere between C and D is Pareto efficient. Um, you know, emphasising this point about, about, uh, about non-uniqueness. Um, and then, uh, and so, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm spending about ten minutes talking about something that takes me two weeks. Uh, but a lot to go through here. Um, but, but Sam's point, conflicts of interest. You know, I mean, it's a massive conflict of interest. Uh, if, 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 if Bruno makes a, a take it or leave it offer to, to Angela, and it's sort of it's assumed in, tech, in, the, in the cortex that that's what's going to happen, that Bruno has the power to dictate the terms, which means we end up at point D. Whereas when Angela's the nice... Um, uh, self-sufficient peasant farmer, she's at point C. Um, at which point, um, so yeah, okay, at which point, I don't think Proudhon gets a mention in the call, which I, I think, I think is, is uh, you know, I think it's a nice and important line, and it seems to be directly applicable to, Sil to Angela and Bruno. I, I, I could occasionally slip into Sylvie and Bruno, which is the, 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 the Lewis Carroll book that, that, that uh, that no one reads, um, but uh, um, all properties in, uh, that in this diagram, all property is theft. Uh, you know, it, but moving between Pareto efficient outcomes, Proudhon is right. Okay, and that's what gives me misgivings about this. About uh, about this, um, but I'll come back to the misgivings. Um, then we move on to democracy. So Angela now has power to influence outcomes. Uh, you know, the, the one person equals one vote rather than one pound equal one vote. Um, and, uh, and so we have... I mean, Sam was saying earlier on, shifting... It's all about, you know, the, it's, it's just the endowments that matter. I mean, the institution... In this diagram, it is, it is just the endowments that matter. So institutions are represented by shifts in the endowment points. Um, and um, so, so the, the, we have a shift in endowment from point D... Uh, where, uh, uh, before the law to point F, where uh, Angela can now uh, uh, choose only to work a shorter number of hours and have a minimum uh, 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 food consumption at point F. And then the, the question is, will, you know, will we stick at point F, uh, uh, the shifting the endowment point, or, uh, or, um, uh, or, or will we go somewhere else? And then, and then you introduce the concept of how do you know that that's not a Pareto efficient point? And there are different ways of assessing that. Uh, it, 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 interestingly, the mathematical, the, the, our economics and mathematics students say MRS isn't equal to MRT. And that's it. <laughs> they, don't, they stop there. Um, uh, whereas uh, I prefer to think about it in terms of is there a feasible uh, Pareto improvement from this point? Uh, and, you know, and those are relatively easy to demonstrate. But you, I mean, the simplest one is that Angela can... If Angela moves from there to there, she's no worse off, and Bruno's share is bigger, so there's a, it's a Pareto improvement. Um, uh, and so, you know, you spend time demonstrating that, and what you end up with is that um, you've now narrowed down... Uh, this shift here narrows you down so that actually now what we used to call the contract curve lies between H and G, a much narrower part of that. But the institution has shifted which bit of it's going to be. But as Sam points out, you then have non-uniqueness. You don't know where you're going to end up. Uh, but, but money will be on the table until you get to that point. Um, and so you're, you're co have we mentioned Coe's yet? I've, has Coe's come in? Yeah, but I'm saying at, in Unit 5, I'm not sure if Coe's has actually been mentioned. Yeah, I, yeah, I think not. I don't think it's by name. I'm not sure. No, but I mean, you know, I think of this as being cosy and bargaining. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, uh, the, the cosy and bargaining opt 
co costless bargaining will take you to somewhere between H and G, but we don't know where it'll be. But it's, but it's a very significant narrowing th of things down. But then we're... Uh, so, and so, and, and so, you know, so uh, there, isn't, there isn't any money left on the table if we have cozen, cozen bargaining. Okay, so just briefly to sort of... Um, what, what do our students get out of this? I mean, I think they get lots of valuable tools, but this is where I sort of move into sort of misgivings mode. They learn that Bruno is a parasite. Bruno is Bruno the bad, okay? In all, in all situations. So, you know, when he's a slave owner, he's, he's parasitic and, 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 and brutal, uh, but even when he just owns the property, he's still a parasite. Because what we have is a zero-sum game. Um, Bruno's rich because Andrew is poor. Now, is this a feature of capitalist economies? Is Britain rich because India is poor? That's a conclusion that I think students could, could leap towards. Indeed, the, 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 the video that, that, that Christian showed uh, yesterday suggest that at least at an early stage, students maybe have that idea. They walk around Bristol saying, we're rich because the slaves were poor, because we stole, we stole Bristol from the slaves, in the same way Bruno stole steel, steals from Angela. Um, and I think the problem there is just a simple analytical point that Bruno's a landowner. In a world with just land, with, 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 with no accumulated factors, it is a zero-sum game. But Bruno's not a capitalist. Once we have capital accumulation, then Bruno could be a much more benign person. But we don't get to capital for, for 12 more units. This is the, the wonders of the capitalist economy, but capital doesn't enter until unit 16. Uh, and I, and I, my view is that's too late. Um, uh, and uh, I was looking through to see whether we get to the gains from inequality. Uh, the possible gains from inequality, which are discussed, but I mean, maybe, maybe they come on earlier on. But at this stage, inequality, you know, students come in, as you say, saying inequality is a bad thing. We're worrying about inequality. And it takes till unit two, 22 to, make, to, 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 to raise the possibility that maybe inequality is a necessary feature of a capitalist system. Um, so uh, I, I worry a little bit about this. And, and I, I, you know, so the, the, the suggestions, can we, can we rehabilitate Bruno a little bit? He's Bruno the Bad to begin with, but, you know, uh, we may remove... I think at one point we do remind the students that maybe Bruno's just old. And he's saved all his life and born to a little plot of land which he rents out to Angela. Um, and so, you know, what, there when we start talking about fairness with the students, I, don't, I try and sort of rehabilitate Bruno a little bit by saying, what do you mean by fairness? Is, it, is a 50-50 share fair? Well, you know, what if Bruno's got nothing else to live on? Um... Uh, but, but also, you know, if Bruno could invest, we could show the impact, even if we haven't had capital, explicitly, we could show the impact if Bruno invests in some capital to make Angela more productive. Um, and Angela can't do that, because Bruno, Angela has no resources. Bruno's, Bruno is the only person who can do that. Um, uh, uh, Bruno, or just maybe an innovator, you know, again, anticipating those things. So I, I, I think... I, I, I would like Bruno to be redeemed. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think it would take very big changes, but I think, I think you know, I, I, when I, I, a lot of the discussions I've heard in the last day, uh, couple of days uh, are saying, you know, it's good because students, this student have the intuition for this. Surely part of the point of economics is to say to people, here's your intuition, and it's wrong. You know, if all economics does is say to people, here, you know, you think this is why the world is, and you're right, and here's a model that shows you that you're right, I don't think we're contributing very much. We have to be able to say to people, no, what you thought was right was wrong. Bruno is not necessarily bad. In this model, he's bad, but we can make him good. We can make him wonderfully good. Uh, you know, because the hockey stick is, is Bruno's hockey stick. Well, I mean, you know, according to the peon of praise of capitalism that comes in Unit 1, but it sort of it, it gets forgotten for quite a long time. Okay, I, 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 I'll stop. Unfortunately, it's time, yeah. Yes. I, I, you, you, do, no, 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 I've, well, I, I've done, I've done. I can donate some minutes if you need them. Okay. We've had a difference of opinion, so it's a good time. We don't, Sam and I agree on everything.
Honestly. The chair is supposed to say anything. Uh, okay. Because the absence of any serious consideration of gender in this core is bothering me, and I'm trying to be quiet about it. So the fact they get married doesn't impress me. <laughs> <laughs> and that she's therefore not a slave. Okay. Well, I'm also, Bruno's a man, and he's bad. Yes. Yeah. That's right. But now she's dependent on him. Yeah. Uh, let's let's. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I raised the question. <laughs> Good. Okay. So before we enter the the discussion of the marital life of Bruna and Angela, let me just briefly talk to you a bit about. Stephen has done a great job explaining the Bruna and Angela model. So I just want to highlight a couple of things. What students learn from this, what students find difficult from this. A bit uh, similar story before, but I'll be I'll be short. So Sam has said this, but I'll repeat it. Students with core, we encourage them from the very beginning to think about institutions, to think about whether the, how the rules of the game end up affecting what people decide, people's allocations, and the economic outcomes. We call, uh, we call them the rules of the game, and students really get this. It's one expression that really sticks in their minds. And even if three months later you tell them, well, if we change the rules of the game, they really connect it to the stuff they've done before, and it's something that really, really sticks in their minds. Uh, so what this model helps students to do, remember this is unit five, first year students, they're, they're beginning with economics. Uh, and something that they struggle a bit even with in this model is to clearly distinguish between what's a constraint, what's a constraint imposed by technology, what's a constraint imposed by biology, which other constraints or effects can institutions be having, and what's the role of preferences in the conflict of uh, opposing, pre like preferences, conflicting preferences, preference over a share of the same thing, basically. What's the role of all of that in the final outcome? So I believe in a standard principles course, these things are not so salient because constraints are a are a budget constraint and preferences are one functional form. And here we just make a reflection. We're thinking about this, maybe this life, or we're thinking about this medieval world in which there's a landowner, and etc. So I believe it's much better to get the right idea in their minds of what's one thing, what's what's the other. Um, and as we were saying before, like this thing of making Angela slave, like this example of a gun, really makes things makes it very clear. What happens when someone has full power and then there is no necessity to agree on anything, there's no necessity to bargain, then that person can just point. What's the point in the feasible set that person prefers? And we do that by giving Bruno a gun. And this is something that can be brought even later. So when we're studying like the labor market, they say, well, if we gave the employer, if we gave the employee a gun, then how does the relationship between both change and how does, how does this affect, affect the bargaining? Something that is struggle a bit with is this role of this reservation option that we say like, well, she has a fallback option, she goes back to her family or, or the government gives her something. And how the fact that she has this fallback option affects what she's willing to accept. Again, this is very similar to what I was saying in the, in the case for the, of the labor market. This notion of opportunity cost and this notion of your other alternatives affecting what you're doing is really something that, that take some time. And as Stephen made a great explanation of this, Pareto efficiency is something that we say, well, you can't make uh, anyone better off without making someone else worse off. And they believe they understood it because it sounds very simple, ex ante. But then they struggle to distinguish between what's the total level that we produce and how we shared it and how that compares with Pareto efficiency in this problem. If it's not solved here, it will end up showing when we learn about monopolies, when we learn about competitive markets. So it's a good this model is a very good opportunity to prompt them to think about this, this Pareto efficiency notion. And something that I found throughout like these years is that the book makes a big, big effort in leaving very clear that Pareto efficiency and optimality from a normative point of, say, point of view is a di there are two different notions. They may coincide in some cases, but very frequently they don't. This is something students will have very clear if you work with, with this material. Something else is we, as economists, again, we are very used to saying, well, let's just decide what's the, uh, how much we, sh we should produce, and then we just leave 
bargaining indetermined, they will bargain over it, we just care how much is totally produced. No, so this is frequent, I mean, even in, in research, uh, like we, we are very used to like saying, oh, there's they're just all the planner's problem and then prices and all of that will, will get determined eventually, we don't care about that. But students are struggle about this. Students sometimes want a definite answer. The thing of telling them, well, they will, there will be a couple of extra constraints imposed by law, but then they will be deciding within this range is also something that sometimes it takes a bit uh, to stick in their mind, so it's good Maybe some of the experiments that, that mm, they were talking about before can be a good idea to think, well, now they can bargain over it, just very similar as you were bargaining in this market versus in this fish market example, because it's also something that, that, that they find relatively hard. And this is something, again, that will be useful in later units and in later studies of economics, because once these type of ideas, like private optimality, how we bargain, etc., are clear, then it's links to a lot of units, like uh, I say, their externalities. And this model that we introduced relatively early on, it's a good idea to have it in mind and bring, go back to it. Uh, as we study other problems, the first thing that comes to mind is this conflict between firms and workers. Uh, what is the role of institutions determining what workers can do, what firms can do, how possible bargaining over wages can, can, can happen between them. Principal agent problems, again, are a crucial part of core. They are present in the material const constantly, and I believe this is usually thanks to this. I believe they get a very clear understanding of it, so that's one of the positive things. And I just want to show you a couple of ways of how these institutions and rules of the game show up later. So this is one exercise we usually do, and it's usually quite interesting, which is the role of outsourcing even the threat of outsourcing production, we have a, a clothing company producing in, in northern England and then there is the threat that that clothing company will move to Bangladesh. How is that affecting the balance of power between, between employers and employees? How that might end up affecting the wage? So we can use the labor market model to think about this. And so like how the rules of the game and how institutions can, can affect this, this type of outcomes. Uh, it is also true uh, that this is not always about pure conflict over a bit like what Stephen was saying. This is not on, this is not purely a zero sum game, and we make the point quite later on in the in the book. But for example, in Unit 16, there's a big point to say: well, institutions help to explain why some countries do better than others. A uh, big example is, for example, inclusive versus exclusive labor unions. Uh, as a Spaniard, our country will always be as an example of what goes wrong in the labor market in Europe versus some other countries. But there is this idea of how institutions, how we uh, arrange, end up also explaining what's the size of the pie and how we can, uh, how some countries end up growing more than others, for example. Uh, and there's also an important notion which is also missing maybe in other courses, in other principles courses, which is that institutions are endogenous, they might be affected uh, how, as the economy progresses, it also affects institutions which in turn affects again how the, how the economy works. This is a bit like what, what we were talking yesterday about this Unit 22 and these models of the, um, of the, of the dictator versus democracy, etc. But they, we also really make the point that every time we change an institution, there's going to be, or we change laws, policies, etc. there will be winners, there will be losers, so there is a tension, there is difficulty on changing those. And thinking about all of these things, and after having gone through all of these models, if you get to Unit 19, uh, then this makes much easier to talk about things like inequality and the role of institutions in inequality, because students are very ready to think about this because they've been exposed to differences between landowners and, and, and farmers or differences between workers and employers. So they tend to think very naturally about all of this thing and they are ready to answer interesting policy relevant questions such as for example this one I've taken like what are the economics effects of migration, can it affect some people more than others, who benefits, who loses. And of course, like uh, particularly given, given current political events, 
talking about this type of thing is extremely interesting for students because they're seeing it uh, every day in the news and it also can be connected with, with economic research. So just to summarize a bit like how they learn about this, this institution. So while learning about this, they hopefully fully understand basic economic notions that they would study in a more restricted context, in, in, in a more traditional type of, of microeconomics course, such as Pareto efficiency, such as bargaining power. So there is some type of constraint maximization behind all of this. Here we are bringing institutions that determine how this happened to the picture since the very beginning. And that's clear because, again, that's what they observe in reality and that's what we've been observing in history. This makes them more critical, more ready to analyze things from complexity, but it introduces one challenge for any lectures, teachers in tutorial sessions, etc., which is to keep them focused. So reality is complex. There are many effects going in many directions, and there is, there can be a tendency to end up saying, "Well, we can't know because everything's so." complicated and the model can say this but the model can say that and if I merge this, cur this curve too much or too little effects might be different this might benefit some some person or the other which is in the end a challenge in general of research uh, and it's good to always refer them to the book that there is data we always are trying to use data to falsify our claims to see whether the model we are using makes sense or not uh, always tell them like to move one curve at a time, to think about the effects individually. But if their conclusion is, well, the effects of immigration on, on wages for low-skilled workers are unclear, that's, that's a, fair thing to, a fair thing to conclude. Like if we just, there are some cases which effects might depend on, on several forces, and that's fine as long as they explain it clearly and well. So it's just about using models and using them well and falsifying with data. And I believe that's one, one of the major challenges with, with this material. Yeah. And that's it. I leave some, some time for the discussion. Uh, I want to say a couple of things. First, there's something I realized when you were talking, which I, I really liked because you emphasized it. Uh, and this is quite accidental. The first mention of Pareto efficiency in the core curriculum is to show that slavery is Pareto efficient. Now, that's beautiful because students can't get it out of their heads that the idea of Pareto efficiency has to be something good. But uh, so it just happened the way we developed the thing that the very first example is one in which they couldn't possibly think that this meant good. And uh, the second thing is. A new generation of students may, of course, think it's bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where, where, do the, uh, where is the first mention of the word equilibrium in the, in the core curriculum? Because students think equilibrium means optimal, right? I mean, that's obvious. That two, two words mean the same thing. The first mention of equilibrium is the Malthusian equilibrium trap, which is a bad equilibrium. Uh, so I mean, the, the, I, I was just thinking, we didn't plan this, but we really love the fact that these two words that are so misunderstood and so thought to be good turn out to be, obviously, uh, the students' first meeting of them is quite different. Yeah, and, the, and I think also just to reinforce that, the, the first encounter with a market mm. is, of course, monopoly. So that's also pr pretty yeah, inefficient. Yeah. But the, um, uh, the, the problem with Bruno the Bad is that Bruno the Bad comes after the heroic Schumpeterian innovator who is celebrated in units one and two, I mean, page after page. Uh, and of course, many people think that this, the core curriculum is very right wing because the, of this, as you called it, as Stephen said, this peon to capitalism uh, in the... So the real question, and I think the, 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 is not... Uh, I mean, we, of course we understand that people with a lot of power do a lot of good through their innovative and other processes, but I think it has more specifically to do with capital goods. That is the absence of, a, of a, that kind of role, which obviously has to be part of the Schumpeterian model too, but we don't stress it. Mm -hmm. And we don't stress it for obvious reasons, which is we, we, we want to keep things to two dimensions, yeah. but there are costs. And the last thing is just a technical point. This model is based on a trick, which is, as uh, Stephen said, the quasi-linear uh, utility uh, function and the fact that Bruno only cares about grain. That's what allows us to separate the allocation problem, which is how many hours she works, 
that's the horizontal dimension, from the uh, uh, distribution conflict, which is the vertical dimension. That's, of course, not a general rule. I mean, typically you have something like an expansion path. And uh, we tried that the first, in the, the first time we tried this. That's what we had. And uh, even experienced teachers said it was just impossible. Uh, so uh, what we've tried to do is use the trick as many times as possible, because it allows us to do a separation, which in principle is something we want the students to think about, but which actually relies on a mathematical trick to actually teach it. Yeah, uh, th th it's 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 a it's a danger. It's a the first time I taught this. Um, I don't think I, I I certainly hadn't intended to say anything offensive, but simply talking in a, in the sort of stark economists' way that that that, that economists do. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I I was very I was well aware that I, that my audience is fifty percent black, um, uh, and so but but e and so I was treading. I thought I was treading carefully, but. Um, I think actually what I said was I said a remark, even slave owners care about their slaves as capital. And a student said, no, they didn't. You know, you should see, you know, there's lots of evidence that they didn't care about their slaves at all. And, and of course, they didn't care about them as human beings. They cared about them as capital. Mm. Uh, well, actually, they probably, some of them did care about them as human yes, beings, which complicates the matters further. The representative slave owner didn't care about their yeah, slaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it, but, I, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think, Economics is dangerous, and so we have to, you know, I think we have to sort of confront the fact that economics is dangerous and, and, and just be, you know, we, um, I, 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 there were no explicit complaints, and, and, I, and I, think, I think they, you know, they, on the plus side, I think they valued the fact that, that it was recognised how important power is, and I think in a sense that, you know, I'm completely with Sam that, you know, the, the standard textbook, the endowment point is just the endowment point, but you just do not know where the endowment point comes from. Um. Yeah, I should add that in the in the green, the economy, society, and public policy, um, we we set out the the kind of historical trajectory that lies behind the Angela and Bruno story more explicitly than it actually appears in, um, right. in the economy. And so again, if some of you are dipping into it, have a look at that, and uh, you know, if you think that that helps, but to deal with um, perhaps the point that Stella raised then we'd like to hear, hear your feedback. Okay, we have one more minute. Another speaker, or should we take a bonus minute for lunch since we're supposed to... Oh, you, Sam, you want... Yes, no, we'll go. The, yes, you know, okay, let's go with it. No, I want, I want oh, to, Wendy to, had maybe a housekeeping thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Let me just um, say that what, what's been mentioned over the, the last couple of days is that uh, what we want to develop yeah, is a community of, of our, we think of it as a community of, of curriculum innovators and, and that means that we have to share things and uh, we, had a, we had an initial pilot platform for sharing and some of us, Christian, uh, Stephen, um, we participated, Antonio, we put stuff up there and we, I think we learned quite a lot actually. Uh, but as everyone knows who's studied anything about um, uh, sharing platforms, uh, it, it's difficult to get momentum, it's difficult to get people to engage and to even go there and look. So we've developed a new version of this <coughs> thing called Core Labs, and it's not open to the, to the great unwashed public yet, it's not kind of privileged um, parties to get the first go at it. Um, and it's, it is very much a beta, but we, we learned from the first time when we tried to do this. So one, one of the things that, uh, that, that we've done here is to, that, that there'll be a kind of news feed coming into it. Something that I've learned t in the last couple of days is, you know, you people are here because you heard you knew something about core, and some of you are teaching it, and some of you who are teaching it didn't know that there were apps available, Android app and a Windows app for offline use. And we've pumped out that information through blogs, it's on the website, but you know, why are you going to kind of go around looking at things if you haven't crossed your mind that they might be there? So we hope that this 
platform if it ever works. I don't <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, I I'll think it's your surname, Gonzalo. No, but no. Right. Let me check. I can also try my surname. Um, uh, the, the, so which we're going to try and have coming through here news. So this week, for example, there are many blogs that have gone up. Um, and so hopefully it'll be a place that you just check where it is. You think, oh, they're going to be interested to be there. Mm. And then because you go there, you'll see, oh, someone's okay. posted their, their slides from this workshop, and you're hoping to use them in a presentation in your department. So Slides and use them, that kind of thing. Um, so we seem to be having a little bit of trouble. Yes, it's not because it doesn't. It doesn't work. Mine works. It, it, no, mine in my computer it works. It does work. Great. Okay, so people have got it. Actually, if I can. Yeah. So this is, I this, could is, also. this is what it looks like. If you, if you <laughs> uh, this is the dashboard. Um, it says, you know, welcome to the beta version of Core Labs, blah, blah. Uh, if you look at, um, at my contacts, okay, so you haven't got any contacts yet. It's kind of a bit sad, but you could, you could find one. So you could search for a user. Let's see if you can find me. Test. In my computer, it works. Search. Yes, look at that. Yes. Found <laughs> okay, there I am. Okay, so I'm there already. Yeah, no so, point. given that you're in there, you create your own profile. You find a nice uh, sort of incognito picture like this to mm -hmm. put yourself in there, and mm -hmm. then you can um, you can look at the groups. Oops, sorry. So I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working anyway. So it's fine. yes. Uh, so here, there's a group. Yes. So the, the, this group actually is open. Uh, to every one of you, and it's called uh, Doing That's Economics Are Users. And if you open if you open that up, you can see that this is a message from Ralph Becker, who says, uh, use this group to discuss cases for the R versions of doing economics and make suggestions about how these could be improved. So um, just let's have a quick show of hands. Has anyone started to think about maybe using the R versions of the doing economics? Yep, Christian, always the first adopter ahead of the <laughs> um, So Christian will, will engage in this thing, tell Ralph that he really likes the, the first project that's up there in R, but for his students, what he really needs are the, uh, the R um, markdown files, which will allow the students to take the code directly and place it in R rather than copy-paste from, from the, the website. So. Ralph will get the message and say, well, Christian, we're already doing that, but uh, thanks for the, um, the tip that we should do it quicker. And, and other people who are looking will see that that's, that's showing up. Uh, there will be other groups. Um, I, it, you won't be able to find uh, the, another group I created because I didn't invite you. But um, the, the, You can make a group yourself. You can invite people to the group. So I've created a group. Uh, which I will invite you all to, which is called something like um, uh, Cause Labour Market Model and the Aggregate Economy. And that's, that just has an open invitation for people to uh, ask questions. You know, if you're curious about that model or there's something that you find puzzling or difficult, then you can post that. Someone like uh, David Hope will send you an answer saying, it's easy to deal with that problem, just here are my three slides. That's all you need. So that's the idea of, um, of, the, of the core labs. And it's the engagement with, with, with it that will make it work. So uh, we'll get over these, um, you know, some of these little technical issues and uh, make sure that everyone can get on. And in particular, this, this news feed here will you know, become so enthralling and engrossing that you'll want to look at it, you know, check it once or twice a week to see what exciting things are happening and new offers are available from Core and you'll see that when you've produced something yourself that it will also appear uh, there as something for, for, the, for the community. So are there any other questions? Gonzalo will get this going during the lunch hour so you can come yeah, talk someone, to him. I mean my phone um, is working, it's just with the, it's not working this computer. Yeah, so I don't know. Yes, but yes.
Yeah, so um, yeah, so it'll be, it'll be great if everyone can log on and um, and we can start getting some conversations going. I think some of the things that Antonio and Umberto were raising about the games are where quite quickly we would like to get some people working on some some more games that we can slot in.